recently, uh, we've had the Chief of the, uh, the Navy, um, Vice Admiral Noonan, talk about the importance of our sea lanes and our sea routes. And he said recently, the security and prosperity of Australia is tied directly to the sea. Over 90% of our international trade comes by sea. 5,000 commercial visits, ships, sorry, 5,000 commercial ships make over 30,000 calls to Australia ports each year. We've always been a maritime uh, nation and we need to recognise just how important the protection of Australia's sea routes are. So I'd just like to very briefly introduce Rear Admiral Jonathan Mead, AM, Royal Australian Navy, who's the commander of the Australian fleet. Initially specialising in mine clearance diving explosive ordnance before undertaking principal warfare officer training. He's posted as an anti-submarine warfare officer in uh, HMAS Melbourne and HMAS Arunta. Fleet anti-submarine uh, warfare officer and executive officer of Arunta. As commander of HMAS Parramatta, he saw active service in the North Arabian Sea as part of Operation Catalyst in 2005 and 6 when his ship was awarded a meritorious unit citation and he was awarded an, uh, uh, an AM. He undertook studies at the Indian National Defence College in 2007, after which he was appointed as Australia's Defence Advisor to India. In 2011, he was deployed to the Middle East, where he commanded Combined Task Force 150, responsible for maritime service counterterrorism, and was awarded a commendation for distinguished service. He then served as Commander, <coughs> Surface Force, and then on promotion as Rear Admiral, as Head of Navy Capability. Rear Admiral Mead holds a Master's Degree in International Relations, a Master's Degree in Management. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage Rear Admiral Jonathan Mead. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. It's a, it's a great privilege and honour to be here amongst you all. Um, it's great to see um, some serving members, Anita, uh, Tony, uh, John, uh, but more to the Institute and it's, it's a point that I always lament about is your role is so fundamentally important in, uh, as your charter says, um, encouraging, promoting, stimulating the, the debate and the, the strategic narrative on military security and the defence forces. And I think that that's something that we lack and it's actually something that the Navy itself is very poor at communicating. You'll see through my presentation, I actually think that we are quite good at uh, executing our role of what government wants us to do, but we are not very good in being able to um, explain what we do. You mentioned, Paul, that the Chief of Navy has already spoken about, um, I think, the theory behind um, and the linkages behind the sea communication and Australia's economic prosperity. And so I probably won't labour the, the theoretical aspects. My, my presentation will be more empirical, and as the Fleet Commander, um, I've got the remit to execute uh, government and the Chief of Navy policy. Um, as a, and as a practitioner, you'll see by my, my presentation will be very much about um, what we've been up to um, and what we're doing right now when it comes to uh, sea power and, and sea routes. So I actually have a, a very short video to start with. Some of you may have seen it before. This, this just sort of highlights what we've been up to the last couple of months, and then I'll continue on with the presentation. Later.
protecting uh, the country, our security, our economic prosperity. I've shown that video, that three minute video, and I think that that neatly encapsulates what we do. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail now. I did forget to me uh, forgot to mention um, that Paul uh, spoke about the very sad passing of Major General Maitland. My wife is a Maitland and she recalls uh, many stories uh, about when her and her parents used to have regular get togethers with the Maitland clan over in the uh, northern suburbs there. And uh, it was his passing um, was a uh, was a, a loss for Australia. Um, you may have seen this slide before. Um, obviously, uh, Australia there in the middle, uh, land mass 7.6 million square kilometres. Our, our coastline is 36,000 kilometres. If you include uh, our offshore territories and our islands, it's about 55,000 kilometres. Our EEZ is the third largest in the world. It comes to about 4% uh, of the uh, uh, world's sea mass. Um, depending on which figures you use and which year is between 90 and 100% of our trade comes in uh, by the seas. Uh, to the north there in the South China Sea, depending on which figures you use, there's about 3 trillion, 3 trillion US dollars of trade passes through there annually. Um, so I'll just... So, on Sunday, so Paul spoke about Saturday where we commissioned HMAS Brisbane, fantastic event. As soon as I did that, uh, I jumped on a plane and we travelled over to Western Australia to farewell HMAS Ballarat on Sunday. And she is now uh, uh, departed for a nine month deployment to the Middle East. Uh, the operation is called Off Manitow. She is the 67th ship that we have sent to the Middle East and that is an enduring commitment that we have in that area. When you see that this slide, when you see the build of this slide, um, you, you, you often you hear the narrative about the Indo-Pacific region. Um, you'll see what we do neatly coincides, and there's no coincidence in what we do, neatly coincides with these major sea routes but also our area of strategic interest, the Indo-Pacific. So to the left, cross draw an arc, the Manitou area is probably uh, the furthest left. And if I was to draw the right-hand arc in the Pacific, you'll see uh, another, as we get a bit further on there, uh, we have got one of the ships at the moment, HMAS Hobart. And we do tend to focus in that area. We do have a couple of nodes uh, that were quite specific uh, that we put a lot of our effort and resources into. One of them is the Middle East, and you'll see that the others will develop. Um, the, the Ballarat is, a, is a, a great news story because she has spent about the last three or four months preparing for this nine-month mission. And four weeks ago, she well, four weeks and three days, she had finished her mission readiness workup, and she's a West-based West, West -based ship. Many of her family, many of the families, are based here on the east. On a Saturday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, we have to call the commanding officer up and say, Hey Paul, you've got to crash sail your ship with your people. Bring the helicopter, get the helicopter back, because there is the solo around the world yachts people that had uh, turned, the, the yachts had been dismasted. They had lost uh, essentially all of the uh, superstructure, and there were two yachtsmen, a solo, uh, except for yachts, which were badly injured. 2,000 nautic miles south down in the, in the Southern Ocean. And the ship sailed within six hours, it was able to get all its people back in six hours, sailed six days down, treacherous conditions. They recovered their um, the stranded yachts people, brought them six days back. Um, it, it does highlight the type of calibre of people we have in the military, and specific the Navy, that they will do that, noting that they were about to embark upon another far more enduring commitment nine months and length away from their families. Um, her sister ship, HMAS Warramunga, returned mid-year from a nine-month deployment to the Middle East. She intercepted and destroyed 32,000 kilograms of hashish, 2,000 kilograms of heroin for a combined street value of $2 billion. You sometimes see on TV the AFP will do a media interview and they'll say that they've intercepted 50 kilograms of heroin, around a street value of $20 million, you 
you'll see that they put that out on the table. And there's, there's, um, uh, there's a lot of recognition on that, rightly, rightly so. If you look at the figures from what Warramunga did, 32,000 kilograms at $2 billion. And that's $2 billion of money that would have been used to be funneled and channeled through the region, through, counter, um, through terrorist organisations. Um, it, it's $2 billion which has been taken off to stop the flow of arms up there. It, and the Australian ship is by far, by far, the most valued unit up there by all the nations. The, they operate on this framework of what called the Combined Maritime Forces. It's US led, um, there are 32 nations involved, the Brits, everyone. And as soon as the Australian ship goes up there, all of the other forces, because there's different, there's a task force that does um, counter piracy, and there's a task force that does counter terrorism, and there's a task force that does the, the, the Arabian Gulf itself. And all the task force commanders fight to get the Australian ship and the Australian P8 or P3 aircraft in because we are the most capable, the best trained, the best equipment, and have the most flexible RO work. And we see that time in, uh, time in, time out. It's a real, it's a real tribute to the ADF. Uh, earlier this year, we had a task group of three ships uh, led by HMAS Toowoomba, and she went through uh, Southeast Asia for seven months. Um, Toowoomba herself sailed 40,000 nautical miles, which is equivalent to 1.85 times around the globe. And the area that they operated in, there were three ships in that task group, the area that they operated in was in the Southeast Asia um, uh, 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 domain. And they did a terrific job, not just at sea, um, um, and a number of the activities which I can't talk about, but also in the regional engagement, regional engagement with the nations up there. We have a ship right now, actually it's a task group of ships, uh, led by HMAS Melbourne that have been operating in North East Asia. Uh, Melbourne is near the end of her seven month deployment, and she's conducted seven major back-to-back -back exercise slant operations during that period. Um, I had the good fortune of visiting Melbourne. She went to China and we went to Jiang Jiang to see the ship, uh, to, to conduct talks with the Chinese. And this followed on from an exercise that I hosted earlier this year in July called Exercise Kakadu. It's a biennial exercise that we do. It's our largest multilateral exercise. This one uh, incorporated 27 nations and navies from around the world, but really it was within that arc. So we had nations from uh, navies from the UAE, uh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, all the way down to eight of the ten Asian nations were involved. China was there, uh, the US was there, France was there. Then we had the uh, the inner arc. We had the uh, um, Indonesia, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, Cook Islands, Tonga, Fiji, all the way out through to Chile. There's a reason why we were able to do that, and you, you probably know that uh, Exercise RIMPAC, which the Americans hosted, they um, disinvited uh, the uh, Chinese just before that exercise. But Australia is very much a valued partner that can bring nations from different regions um, of different uh, levels of professionalism and of really of, of nations with different interests get them together into a major exercise of that. There are very few nations like navies that could organise something like Capitol. HMA Satellite led a task group, task force of Five ships and a submarine through the Southwest Pacific and then up to Exercise RIMPAC uh, earlier this year. They were away for about four months. You may have seen that uh, in the media. We're doing a lot of work in the Southwest Pacific. It's one of our, whilst it's not a major trading route, you'll see the trading routes to the north of us strategically, uh, Southwest Pacific is very important to us right now and we're putting a lot of effort to develop a, redevelop a presence there in that area. We've deployed uh, two mine hunting vessels, uh, HMAS uh, Gascoigne and Huon, up through to Korea, and they're now uh, off 
to Japan. Um, that's the furthest that we have deployed those type of ships in over 70 years. The last time was when HMAS Bathurst, a, a mine sweeper, was in Tokyo Bay for the signing of the Instrument of Surrender in 1945. Um, this has been an outstanding success that we have operated up there. And we're operating with a number of different nations and our ships found every mine that was put in our, uh, in our area. Uh, no one else achieved 100%. And not only did we achieve 100%, we found an extra mine which they lost from a previous exercise. And when we said we found a mine over here, they said, uh, said you've got you've got the wrong area, you've got the wrong object, it must be a rock, because we haven't laid that mine. We said, no, no, it's a mine, and they looked back and sure enough, it's one that they lost previously. I mean it's been it's been a fantastic success story. Um, they're heading over to Japan, I said this is the first, we've sent them in over 70 years, and they will then start wanting their way back after they go to Japan, they'll come back in late December, just before Christmas. And we intend to uh, repeat that uh, every year. Our survey ships, we have two survey ships, Melville and Lewin. Uh, they traditionally have operated around uh, Australia doing our survey and charting. We've developed a very forward leading posture. They're now operating off uh, Indonesia and uh, East Timor. So we can get a sense of what uh, the seabed and the bathymetry is away from us. Um, that's the furthest that they've ever deployed, uh, those two survey ships. And they've, they've actually got uh, unmanned gliders in the water that they're putting in that are doing the surveying as well. And we're, we're looking into that uh, very closely to see what we can do in the next couple of years. Um, APEC. So we are deploying nine ships um, for APEC 18. Some have already sailed. They'll all form up in about the middle of next week to do a training exercise. And they will be up there to assist the Papua New Guinea government for APEC 18. We've also, so let's see, Sunday we farewell Ballarat. Saturday we commissioned Brisbane. On the Thursday last week, we commissioned a new air squadron. Uh, it was an unmanned aerial vehicle squadron, 822X. First time we've done that. We now have five air squadrons in the Navy. That's the most we've had since 1984 when we had the carrier. We've got eight flights at sea. So a flight is the helicopter with equipment, with the people. Uh, we've got eight flights at sea. Uh, the, we broke our record for on board HMAS Canberra. So she had seven aircraft embarked earlier this year. That's the most number of aircraft we've had embarked on one ship since the carrier Melbourne in 1982. But unfortunately, Adelaide will beat that in the next couple of weeks and she'll have eight aircraft embarked on board. And it sort of does underscore the level of capabilities that we now have um, in the Navy. Um, and finally, the DDGs. We have a ship over in San Diego right now. Um, right to the right hand side, HMAS Hobart. She's doing her system qualification trials, which is, uh, she's gonna go out to sea very shortly and fire nine missiles. Um, very complex uh, missile firing profiles these are. We're doing that with the US, and that will then certify the ship, the people, and the systems, so we can tell the government that we have a level of capability to be able to deploy that ship. Obviously, the um, sister ship, Brisbane, We'll do the same next year, and then the third ship, Sydney, will do that in about two years' time. Those ships have a level of capability which is unsurpassed in the region. You know what I mean? In the region. They are very, very powerful and lethal warships. Uh, Paul, you spoke about the Feldy before. Um, that is really leading edge. And um, on top of that, we've had some significant announcements this year um, um, when it comes to Navy capability. Probably the most important one being the government decision on the replacement of the Anzac class frigates, which is now the, um, the BAE Type 26 called the Hunter class. Um, ironically, the new frigate will be larger in size than our new destroyers. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, we have, I mean, language can work for you, but language can trip you up. So when we were developing this project, um, 
we said it's, it's, a, it's the future frigate, and the current frigates, uh, the Anzacs, are 3,600 tonnes. And when they found out that the frigate was going to be bigger than the destroyer, they thought we were trying to pull the wool out of their eyes. And it took us a lot of work to say, look, the word destroyer, the word frigate, it's a, it's a legacy from real ones, World War One. Don't be fixated on that. Just be worried about the capability. It's not actually the size itself. It's what's in, involved. Um, but boy, boy, that took a lot of work for that. So, um, so that's that's really what Navy has been doing. You'll see that those um, those highlighted points there um, correlate very closely with our sea lines of communication, and we do that deliberately. Right now, I have. 10 ships deployed overseas. That's the most I think we've had deployed overseas probably 30, 40 years. We've got, uh, we've got the ship off the US. I have a submarine operating uh, around in, um, I'll just say, see, what, can we, see where my finger is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.